This is Physics 2120, and today we're going to talk about finding the electric potential from continuous charge distributions. Just like we did with electric field, we can find electric potential from continuous charge distributions. In this case, let's say we've got this blob of charge over here, and we're going to break it up into small little chunks, and we'll call that little chunk dq. And so the little bit of potential at point P is k dq over R. Now, the nice thing about doing potential for continuous charge distributions is when I'm going to integrate, I don't have to worry about breaking something up into vectors since it only depends on R, not the direction. So to find the total potential, we integrate to include the contributions from all elements, or V is the K times the integral of dQ over R. And this value of V uses the reference of V equals zero when P is infinitely far away from the charge distribution. So let's look at a couple of examples to see how this is done. We found the electric field for a ring. Let's look at the potential for a uniformly charged ring. So P is located perpendicularly <coughs> on the central axis of this uniformly charged ring. It has a total charge Q. What's the potential at point P? Well, we start the way we did before. Find the little bit of potential did a little bit of charge. Then V is equal to K times the integral of dQ over R. Or it's dQ over the square root of x squared plus a squared. Now, on this integral, as we're integrating all the way around the ring, we notice that x squared and a squared are constant. So they'll come out of the integral. And then just, we're just integrating dQ, which is the total charge on the ring. So the potential is kq over the square root of x squared plus a squared. If I wanted to find the electric field at that point, I could take the derivative. So the electric field is minus dv dx, which is minus kq times the derivative of x squared plus a squared to the minus one half power. So we take the derivative, it becomes mi minus one half times that same thing to the minus three half powers times the derivative of what's inside, which is two x, which is kqx over x squared plus a squared to the three halves power. This is exactly what we got when we integrated to find the electric field before, but I think in this case it was slightly simpler. We didn't have to, you know, break the electric field at this point up into components and use symmetry to argue one of them was zero and then multiply by a cosine theta and integrate. We were able to do it relatively quickly and then we just took the derivative to find the electric field. What about a uniformly charged disk? Say I have a disk that has a radius A and a surface charge density sigma. What's the potential at point P? Well, just like we did before, we look at the little bit of potential at this point due to the little bit of charge, so V is equal to K dQ over R. This course case, dQ is sigma dA. Now, I notice in the picture we get dA is 2 pi R dr. Where does this 2 pi R dr come from? Well, the circumference is 2 pi r and the thickness is dr, but we can also just integrate dA to figure this out. So dA is a little bit of area element on this disk. In the little bit of area, the thickness of this little rectangle here is dr, and the arc length of this is r d theta. So dA could also be r dr d theta. So v is k times the integral of sigma r dr d theta over the integral of r squared plus x squared to the one-half power. So the sigma is constant, it comes out, and so the r integral becomes r dr over the square root of r squared plus x squared, and the theta integral is just the integral of d theta, and we go from zero to two pi. Of course, this is two pi, that's where this two pi up here came from. I could either do the full integral like this, or I could recognize and say, oh, my dq is just going to be this ring. Either method works. So then I get 
2 pi sigma k times the integral of r dr over the square root there. We do that integral. We can use a u substitution here if we wanted to. Say u is r squared plus x squared, then du would be 2r dr. When r equals 0, u equals x squared. When r equals a, u is a squared plus x squared. So plug our u substitution in. We get the integral of du over the square root of u, which is the square root of u to the, divided by 1 half. Plug in our values. We get the potential at this point, p, is k pi sigma times the square root of a squared plus x squared minus x. Now, if I wanted to find the electric field at this point, all I would have to do is take the derivative of this. How about this problem? A rod of length L has a total charge of Q and a linear charge density lambda. What is the potential at this point P? Start off after before, V is equal to K times the integral of dQ over R. In this case, R is this right here, which is going to be the square root of x squared plus a squared, and we're integrating x from 0 to L. So, dq is lambda ds. In this case, we're integrating along the x, so it would be lambda dx. <clears throat> so dq is q over L dx. So we plug that into our integral, and now we can take all the constants out and look at what we need to integrate. We know that the integral of dx over x squared plus a squared is the log of x plus the square root of x squared plus a squared. We can look that integral up. We plug that in. Uh, our limits go from 0 to L. When we solve it, we get that the potential is kq over L times the natural log of L plus the square root of L squared plus a squared minus the log of a. Or we can combine the logs and get a nice answer where the log is L plus the square root of L squared plus A squared over A. There's our potential. What about for a uniformly charged sphere? Say I have a solid sphere, radius R, total charge Q. We know when R is greater than R, the potential should just be KQ over R. When it's less than R, we could integrate our electric field from Gauss's law and get the potential difference between any two points in there. If we do that, we can look at the curve for potential. Inside is parabolic, and it joins smoothly here at R with our kq over R. The curve for V is the potential outside the sphere. It's a hyperbola. So what is the potential due to a charged conductor? Well, let's look at two points on the surface of the conductor. At two points A and B on the surface of this conductor here, we know that E is always perpendicular to the surface. And if I want to know the potential difference between these two points, and I'm integrating along this, we know that the path I'm taking, ds, is always perpendicular to E. Therefore, E dot ds is at zero. And the potential difference between two points on the surface of a conductor must be zero. So, V is constant everywhere on the surface of the charged conductor. Delta V equals zero between any two points on the surface. The surface of any charged conductor in equal at electrostatic equilibrium is an equal potential surface. And because the electric field is zero inside the conductor, we conclude that the electric potential is constant everywhere inside the conductor and equal to the value at the surface. So if I were to compare electric field to potential for a charged conductor, the electric potential is a function of R. And the electric field is a function of R squared. And the effect of a charge on the space surrounding it. The charge set up the vector electric field, which is related to force. And the charge sets up a scalar potential, which is related to energy. We know that the electric field is zero inside, and then it goes like 
kq over r squared on the outside. But the potential, if the, this is the potential at the surface, we know if the electric field is zero, that means the potential is not changing, because electric field is equal to dv dx, or the slope of potential. So if E is zero, the change in potential energy is zero, and so we get this constant potential inside of a conductor. Now if I have an irregularly shaped object, the charge density is going to be highest where the radius of curvature is smallest, and low where the radius of curvature is large. The electric field is large near this convex point, having a small radius of curvature and reaches very high values at sharp points. So the field lines are still perpendicular to the conducting surface at all points. The equal potential surfaces are perpendicular to the fields everywhere. Now, what if I had a cavity inside the conductor? We know that the potential is constant on the surface of the conductor and in the conductor, but what about inside the cavity? Well, for us don't have any charges floating around in the cavity, the electric field inside the conductor must be zero. The electric field inside does not depend on the charge distribution on the outside, because for all paths between A and B, delta VB minus VA, which is equal to the integral V dot, ds is equal to zero. A cavity surrounded by a conducting wall is a field-free region as long as there are no charges inside the cavity. Now, if the electric field near a conductor is sufficiently strong, electrons resulting from random ionizations of air molecules near the conductor accelerate away from their parent molecules. These electrons can ionize additional molecules near the conductor. That creates more free electrons. The coronal discharge is the glow that results from the recombination of these free electrons with ionized air molecules. The ionization and coronal discharge are most likely to occur near very sharp points. One way to generate a lot of charge is a Van der Graaff generator. Charge is delivered continuously to a high potential electrode by means of a moving belt of insulating material. So I have this belt which can hold charge. I put a positive potential with maybe a wire brush that's brushing across this insulator and that causes a positive charge to go on this belt. This belt goes up into a metal dome and there's another uh, brush here, some metal that just touches this. And now inside the metal dome, charge always wants to reside on the outside, so this positive charge goes to the outside. And then when the belt comes back down, there's no charge on it. And I continue to build this up and get as much charge on the outside as I want. Very large potentials can be developed by repeated trips of this belt. And protons accelerated through such large potentials can receive enough energy to initiate nuclear reactions. So let's review what we talked about today. We talked about how to get electric potential for continuous charge distributions. dV is equal to k dQ over r, which just leads to V is k times the integral of dQ over r. That's the thing I want you to spend the most time on reviewing for this section of the class. The other thing we talked about is what the potential looks like in conductors, and we learned that potential is constant inside of a conductor.